So I first want to express a lot of gratitude to Google. Um, actually, it's uh, a wonderful uh, honor to be here because I use um, your platforms uh, daily, although perhaps I should go on a fast, a Google fast, but anyway, it enhances my fastness in the world um, because it, I'm able to access um, many, uh, not only facts, but also uh, people all over the world, even the, in the most remote parts of the world, the most, most report, part, remote parts of the Himalayas. Um, I uh, want to say a few things. One is um, I'm not up here to really uh, talk about end-of-life care. What I want to speak about is an exploration of compassion, which uh, is something that I'm beginning to understand uh, in a, an initial way, but also I begin to see as the most important human quality that we are invited to actualize today. And why do I say that? Well, let me um, first recall some words of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Um, uh, His Holiness said, um, compassion is not a luxury. It is a necessity in order for the human species to survive. And I would suggest that uh, we're speaking not only about our species, or His Holiness was speaking not only about our species, but really all species on this earth. And that from my point of view, um, having uh, compassion instantiated into the view and values of Google could be uh, life changing for um, millions of people and also many, many species. But it's important to understand what compassion is. And um, part of uh, my curiosity about compassion comes from the work that Karen was referring to, this work in the end-of-life care field, um, but also the fact that I've been involved in human rights and justice issues since the 1960s. I have the great honor of serving in the Himalayas in our nomads clinic of working with now thousands of people in the most remote villages in the high Him Himalayas uh, who have no access to health care. And um, also having worked as a volunteer in the penitentiary of New Mexico on death row and maximum security for six years and really learning a lot learning a lot about how compassion operates and what it is. And also there's a kind of uh, deficit of compassion in our culture today that is affecting everyone. Why? Well, first let me just say why compassion. Um, very interesting research in neuroscience and social psychology suggests that um, compassion is profoundly enhancing of our immune response. I know that's kind of a, a challenge to integrate that uh, data point, but it's extremely interesting how beneficial compassion is, not only in terms of our immune response, but also in terms of our longevity. And I'm thinking about the uh, story of Nicholas Winton, who died uh, at the age of 106, who was a kind of money guy, young guy, in the Second World War, and who uh, ended up in uh, Czechoslovakia on one mission, but changed his mission when he realized that um, many children were going to be uh, taken to the camps. And he ended up liberating 669 children, saving their lives, and not making anything about it. He did it at great risk. And it wasn't until he was an elderly person that his wife discovered the records of what he had done and actually told the BBC, who secretly assembled those uh, survivors, those you know, people who had grown up in England, who'd been placed in homes, who found uh, their life and livelihood. And I don't know if you've seen the video, but you should. 
every time I see it, I just kind of choke up. Where this old guy is sitting there and in a BBC theater, a theater about the size of this theater, and um, the BBC moderator introduces him to the woman next to him and says, do you recognize her? And he said, no. He said, well, you saved her life. And then uh, he began to choke up. And then the moderator said, basically, um, anyone whose life was saved by Nicholas Winton, will you please stand up? And the whole theater, everyone in the theater stood. Very powerful. Because um, a person who um, does such a selfless act and seeks uh, no outside recognition, but recognizes within themselves the imperative to serve others and lives within those principles modestly and in a way secretly is an extraordinary example to us. I wanted to understand compassion better. You know, I've worked in medical systems literally all over the world. Um, I've also uh, had the experience of having compassion well up in me and um, break my life open uh, in a good way um, to the truth of suffering and also the possibility to transform suffering and to realize that I, as a, a person who was born in the early 1940s, um, feel that imperative uh, on a daily basis. What can I do to serve? What can I do to end suffering? How to um, uh, keep myself viable to meet the truth of suffering in this world? So I was so fortunate to be appointed as a distinguished visiting scholar at the Library of Congress. And in the course of my time at the library, I began to map out compassion because I realized that, first of all, even though neuroscience and social psychology, the research being done in these areas, indicates the great benefits of compassion, not only to those whom are served, but those whom experience it, and to society in general, but also that compassion is, um, in a way, challenged in our society right now and that um, it's difficult uh, to actually train people in compassion, not as an acquired skill, but to actually create the conditions where compassion is an emergent process in our subjectivity. And so I sat in the Library of Congress and began to look at compassion from many points of view. And I recognize that um, compassion is not possible without attentional balance. This is really critical. Our capacity to actually look deeply into what is happening in the present moment necessitates that we are able to be very grounded and not divided in our attention, not dispersed in our attention, nor distracted. And just that is a kind of first base, if you will. I mean, in a world where our technology has, is actually designed, interestingly enough, not necessarily to enhance focused attention, but actually to unground us so that our consciousness can be, if you will, inhabited or colonized by messages which aren't necessarily uh, benefiting us or others. So the cultivation of attentional balance is really critical so that we have high resolution of perception, that we're able to also sustain our attention on any given object, including our own subjective experience, for more than a moment. It's really hard to put aside our brain prosthesis uh, because we are, in a certain way, we. These technology, technological devices have been um, so deeply insinuated into my life and also I think the lives of uh, most of us in this room and who are listening um, to this uh, talk. 
But how do we actually have the capacity to allocate our attention to an individual or to a situation without leaving, abandoning that moment? So being grounded and cultivating attentional balance is essential. It's also essential to be pro-social in a way to lift out of the negative narratives that uh, inhabit us. And prosociality is the opposite of antisocial. So it's very uh, powerful to engage in practices that actually nourish beneficial qualities within us. It's also essential to have a motivational foundation, which is unselfish, which is ethical, which is about non-harming which is engaged in a process of constantly uh, inviting us to deconstruct our fear and open up to the world in a way where we're in this beneficial, non-separate, non-objectifying relationship with so-called others. And to actually develop the capacity to expand our subjectivity to include the experience of others in a way that is healthy. It's also essential in terms of compassion to have insight. Not only insight at the level of a metacognitive capacity, which is to stand outside of our experience, to see the truth of impermanence, to understand that all beings are uh, really aspiring to be happy, even the most deluded ones, and the most politically confused ones. But also that um, we, on one level, are very connected to the, that person across from us, the dying person, the prisoner, our child, our teacher, our boss, but also we are not that person. So the distinction between self and other, understanding that distinction, is critical in terms of us being able to regulate our experience of resonance with whatever is arising in the present moment. So the map grew, and it, I think, has been uh, of uh, help to others. You know, people in the neuroscience and social psychology research world but also it's been very helpful in terms of developing training protocols. And I developed a very simple one um, called GRACE, which I can just share briefly here, which um, uh, many clinicians, and it's actually there's a national GRACE organization in Japan now, uh, many clinicians uh, use. And I'll just give you the shortcut. Uh, the G of GRACE is gathering your attention. You know, how do you really get grounded in this moment? The R of grace is recalling your intention. What is our motivation for any given action? The A of grace is attuning to oneself, to one's own subjectivity, to our somatic experience, to our emotional experience and to the actual cognitive experience that we have before we attune to others. So it, you know, once you understand the protocol, it's a lived and active compassion. It happens in an instant. You can really assay your subjectivity physically, emotionally, and cognitively before you actually include the experience of others into your subjectivity engage in empathy. So this is other attunement. Attuning first to yourself and then attuning to the other. And then from that base, the sea of grace, which is consider what will really serve. And then the E of grace is engage and end. Ending is really important. So this is a tool that uh, um, many clinicians are using and educators at this time. And actually, it's just great if you're a parent or a colleague. It uh, just has a way of grounding you, remembering who you really are, attuning to your own situation before you include others into it and getting grounded and so forth. 
So in the process of working on this project, um, I began to consider how um, the absence of compassion, the absence of attentional balance, the absence of emotional balance, the lack of capacity to tune into one's own subjectivity, the inability to be in resonance with others, and also how fast the reaction time um, often is at great cost in the end, or how fear inhibits us from acting. And over many decades, literally thousands of people in the end of life care field, educators, people involved in corporations, in the business world, um, parents, uh, practitioners, have shared with me the challenges that they've experienced in meeting suffering. And, you know, by the way, um, I'm not just speaking about the kind of dramatic suffering that, for example, I in the end of life care field would encounter. You know, I'm speaking about the kind of day to day suffering that you would encounter as you meet with colleagues who are super upregulated or very depressed or angry, or with a parent whose child has uh, died or whose child is extremely ill. And I began to realize, actually, I suffered in the same way as those who were sharing uh, their difficulties with me. And I located, if you will, uh, five geographies in the ecosystem of our subjectivity that are really extraordinary capacities within our human experience, without which um, we would be uh, deeply challenged as uh, individuals and as a social body and as a body that lives uh, within the environment on this earth. And those five capacities um, were, interestingly enough for me, um, capacities which had uh, a deeply challenged shadow aspect. And there are capacities which we value, but um, we often don't realize that they can make us ill. They can be great hindrances. And this is um, actually what I outlined in the book. I call them edge states because they are ecologies that um, include uh, healthy manifestations, but also they're ecologies that include unhealthy aspects. And it's very important for us to realize um, in this vision of edge states that uh, falling over the edge isn't necessarily a terminal condition, um, that actually climbing back onto the high edge of any of these qualities uh, produces potentially a lot of strength, a lot of character. But it's important to also have the ability to stand on the high edge of any of these capacities to see the entire landscape of the toxic aspect or aspects and the challenged aspects. So the first um, edge that I looked at was altruism. Nicholas Winton was a great example of an altruist, someone who felt the imperative uh, at, just as, you know, as Shanti Davis says, you step on a thorn and the hand doesn't sort of ask the foot permission to remove the thorn. The hand goes immediately to the foot and pulls the thorn out. It's this kind of seamlessness of response. So uh, I read in the New York Times a very interesting story about a man called Wesley Autry. <clears throat> and Wesley Autry was an Afro-American man who was standing on a subway platform with his two daughters. And there were probably 100 people on that subway platform along with him. And all of a sudden, a young white guy had a seizure and fell into the subway tracks. And as this young guy was having the seizure, Wesley Autry saw the uh, oncoming subway, jumped off of the subway platform, leaving his two little girls who were standing right beside him there on the subway platform, got on top of this young guy 
And he realized that um, if he wasn't able to hold this guy down, and he certainly wasn't able to drag him off the tracks in time, that he and this young guy were, would die. And he held this seizing young man down on the tracks, and the subway passed over his head, grazing his mid cap. And he was hailed as a, an incredible hero. And it was a, a decision that was like that. You know, he didn't say, well, I, you know, I don't know, my military background has given me the capacity to do this, and I'll be a big deal in the New York Times, and you know, lauded as a hero. He just went for it. Now, <clears throat> the shadow side of altruism is called pathological altruism. And pathological altruism is that we engage in an action of service toward others or another or toward an institution or toward uh, a country which endeavors to be beneficial, but that that act of altruism actually causes harm to ourselves, to those whom we're endeavoring to serve, to the institution that we perhaps are a part of, to the institution that we're trying to serve, or to the country that we're serving. So a good example is a pathological altruism is what happened in Haiti. Very interesting, this notion of pathological altruism. And also what is so fascinating is um, how uh, tenuous that line is between altruism and pathological altruism. Because if you take the example of Wesley Autry, a very uh, selfless, traumatic act, unprecedented in a certain way, uh, no preconception, just a leap. If the train, the subway had killed him and also uh, killed Autry, he probably would have been deemed a pathological altruist. So it's, so it's very fascinating. We just, you know, the line is uh, fragile, to say the least. There's a big gray area. But it's also a very important uh, quality for us to examine deeply. Because just as the case of Nicholas Winton and of Wesley Autry, um, both of these people acted not selfishly, but from a perspective of complete unselfishness in this very seamless, unfiltered way. And this is, if you will, one of the qualities or aspects of altruism. The second quality that I uh, jumped into, yeah, I heard so much about it over the years. In fact, uh, interestingly enough, I was in a conversation a few days ago with uh, a young uh, Indian man who's a Zen practitioner who is a specialist in AI who said that he can hardly turn on the news. He's so uh, overwhelmed in um, accessing uh, the news today. And he, he had my book and asked me to sign it. He said, you know, I'm, uh, I'm beginning to understand something about empathy from um, what you've written. So empathy is that experience of somatic, emotional, or affective resonance, as well as cognitive resonance with another. We can be somatically attuned, for example, and not be necessarily uh, in resonance emotionally and cognitively, but we can have all three of our perceiving mechanisms uh, engaged, our sensing mechanisms engaged. It's that experience where our subjectivity begins to drop away in terms of the small self, and we practice a kind of increasing inclusivity, which is really important from the point of view of meditation practice, because Fundamentally, our realization in meditation practice, the sort of sign of it is that we recognize that we're deeply interconnected with all beings and things. But when we're 
so connected with all beings and things. When we, for example, over-identify with the dying patient or with our boss who might be angry at us or our child who is acting out or a colleague who's experienced a profound loss, it becomes a very difficult situation where we can experience secondary trauma. And I have to say, um, that young guy in the AI world that I talked to, or who talked to me a few days ago, I have to titrate um, my consumption of news too. Because I notice um, if I take in too much bad news, I begin to shut down. I begin to go numb. So it's very important to understand um, where your boundaries are, what uh, serves your awakening. When one uh, over-identifies with, for example, the Fuhrer in Nazi Germany, where you, it's not just with the ordinary kind of suffering, but it's also, for example, in cults or views or even you know, inside of a corporate system. And you begin to lose your own moral compass, the principles by which you're living. Even a corporation can be a kind of cult, if you will, where diversity is um, not uh, condoned, where it's um, looked on as a threat to identity. So I'm so glad to see so many different colors of seats here and also you know, just a feeling of diversity in this community here. But uh, when that experience of arousal happens in connection with the experience of others, and if that experience of arousal is not regulated, either from a bottom-up perspective, that is the perspective of um, a kind of natural regulation that happens to keep us from moving into overwhelm, or a top-down regulation where we can, sensing into our body, recognize the signals that are coming up from this amazing organism that is a repository of an enormous amount of information that we're often dissociated from, you know, as we are attending to our digital device, for example, um, where we lose touch with the messages coming from the body telling us, oh, I have a lot of fear coming up. I can feel it in my diaphragm. I can feel the tension in my legs. I know I'm violating my integrity. I feel my guts are squeezing. My heart rate is increasing, or I'm witnessing suffering, and I have a vasovagal moment where I'm about to pass out. If we're not able to regulate ourselves, we can be traumatized. We can move into the experience of distress. And this is one of the reasons why practice is so important. It's not about dissociating from the body. It's actually being in this experience of embodiment so that we can sense into our visceral processes and receive the information that's coming up from the body about what kind of response we're experiencing in relation to external events or even internal processes. So this is called empathic distress and empathic over-arousal. It is the shadow side of empathy. The next um, ecology <clears throat> that I looked at with great interest was that of integrity. You know, we can ask what we mean by integrity. And for, from my point of view, integrity has to do with nonviolence and non-harming. How do we actually nurture integrity in a world where there is so much violence, such a deep dissociation uh, from this planet Earth, where war is the norm and where violence is being fed to us through the media constantly. 
And I looked at the shadow side of integrity and saw there are basically four valences to what I've termed moral suffering. And by moral suffering, I'm talking about that feeling of trespass that many of us experience when we engage directly or indirectly in behaviors that are harmful. And they include um, four different expressions. And uh, one of those in expressions is called moral distress. And it's when you see a situation where there is a violation of values, of principles, of uh, beneficence, you see a way through, but you cannot actualize it. Moral distress, moral injury, which is um, well documented in the military, but also um, we see it in education, medicine, and in big corporations as well. And this is when um, you are in a system that is causing harm to others. You either are part of it or you're witnessing it and you feel shame and self-blame, moral injury. The third aspect is called moral outrage. And I have a bit more of a predisposition toward that. I have some toward moral injury and some toward moral distress too. But it is the sense of anger and disgust that arises when you perceive external to yourself acts that harm. And um, it can be chronic. There are many of my friends and I kind of, I don't think I'm chronically in it, but I kind of know it uh, pretty well. Um, the sense, you know, just looking at our political landscape, feeling moral outrage, or looking at war in the world and feeling a sense of moral outrage. And the shaming and blaming, of course, is expressed outwardly toward others. And then the, the fourth one is called um, moral apathy. And actually, I didn't even think about moral apathy at all because you know, I'm in the bubble of my world until I went to see uh, I'm Not Your Negro. And I heard the term moral apathy, and I was like, that's it. It is when we live in a bubble of privilege or of addiction or denial or fear that disallows us from seeing what really is going on at the systems level in our surround, where we have turned away, if you will, from the truth of suffering. And I know uh, recently I was flying internationally, and um, I, I had this, uh, you know, going through the airport as a privileged, uh, Anglo-Saxon Protestant Zen person. Um, <clears throat> and I saw a woman in a burqa uh, coming up beside me. And I, I realized um, she was much in a much more vulnerable position than I. And I had this flash about the privilege that I enjoy. And also of compassion for anyone whose identity puts them on the margin of what appears to be socially and psychologically safe. And I remember just, uh, I did my Buddhist thing. I mean, she probably thought I was crazy, but I put my hands together and made a little bow to her just to make that uh, connection uh, in, in that moment. Integrity. The fourth edge state that I've written about is in relation to respect. And it's when we hold um, really all beings in equal regard. And I had, when I was working in the penitentiary of New Mexico, uh, a really deep experience of walking into a system that is characterized by a lot of violence of working inside as a volunteer for six years with men 
uh, in maximum security and death row. And it was such a wake-up call for me because I walked into that system with a lot of judgments. And actually, what I learned from being inside was um, these are human beings. They've caused immense suffering to others. It was not a matter of me being in a kind of romantic atmosphere internally about the truth of suffering in a very violent, um, rage-filled penitentiary system. But it was developing the capacity to see the truth of a particular kind of suffering per individual. Every individual had a different narrative. Some of the narratives were really horrifying to consider, but at the same time to recognize that beneath the narrative, beneath the actions of any one of those individuals was a human being. No matter that they had raped and killed children or their parents or strangers, there was a human being under there. And part of the work was to actually hold the truth of the narrative as constructed as it was, and also the truth that maybe not this lifetime, but maybe in some lifetime, this one will be liberated from their delusion. So I learned so much working inside that system. But that system, our uh, correction system, is actually a kind of ground engendering phenomenal disrespect. And I began also to look at respect and disrespect in medicine, particularly after a student of mine who was a nurse did a thesis in our chaplaincy training on what is termed horizontal hostility. And this is behaviors of disrespect between peers, bullying, disparagement, third-party communication, dissing, and so forth. And what she uh, brought my attention to is that 15 to 20 percent of nurses actually leave the nursing profession because of having been bullied and just being unable to sustain it. And it's interesting to look at that, you know, in relation, for example, to um, the culture here at Google or the culture in any corporation around gender, for example, around race, ethnicity, around religion, view, around height. I can say as a short woman, sometimes I'm actually treated more like a pet than a person. <laughs> and you can imagine. Uh, that does, uh, that's right, moral outrage, that does nothing for me or the other person. I try to do my best to help set things straight, <clears throat> needless to say. So horizontal hostility is actually rampant in our culture. And it's a uh, complement, so to speak, uh, in uh, the world of verticality is called vertical violence which can happen in a top-down way. And certainly we see it in terms of, well, you see horizontal hostility, for example, in the political arena of how candidates treat each other and speak about each other. I and mean, it's kind of horrifying for our children to witness. But you also see vertical violence in terms of um, the disrespect that our politicians uh, engage in in relation to people who ha are differently abled, or from other cultures, other societies. There's also um, bottom-up vertical violence, where people who are less empowered, less acknowledged, actually manifest a dramatic disrespect uh, toward those who are in power. So part of the work is how do we actually come into this experience of recognizing our fundamental humanity in relation to others, all others. And respect is something that is um, about holding all beings and things, including all species on this earth, in equal regard. The final piece that I looked at 
<clears throat> was uh, burnout and engagement. You know, our capacity to engage in a vocation in work that is meaningful is really important. Our uh, workplaces also have to be non-toxic in order for us to survive. And we also have to have good agreements with our places of employment. Engagement is essential, a sense of enthusiasm, of dedication, having work that is about benefiting others, and working in healthy environments is really essential. And by the same token, um, what happens when those aspects are not part of our work environment, the outcome, of course, is burnout. We become completely exhausted. So I do a big thing on uh, burnout. So you know we can look at our experience in an interesting way because um, whether we're in the human rights field or the healthcare field, all of us um, have, in one way or another, fallen over the edge. And one of the principles operating uh, in this work is how powerful it is not just to fall over the edge and to encounter failure and uh, to be traumatized, but also the repair process that actually builds character, that enhances our resilience, that deepens our sense of flourishing, that gives us deeper meaning. It's really important. And I said at a, another Silicon Valley uh, company yesterday, um, it is important to actually include failure into the equation of success. We know from the point of view of living systems that systems that break down and learn from the breakdown can reorganize themselves at a much higher and more robust level. And robust is the key here, robustness. Our capacity to actually encounter incredible difficulties, loss, sorrow, failure, and to uh, use that experience as a way to engender not only humility, but to engender wisdom. The capacity to see deeply into who we really are. So I ask myself, what was the kind of pivot you know, how do we actually work the edge of these edge states? And I realize that the most important thing that we can do is to actualize compassion. Because compassion gives you the attentional balance, emotional balance, and insight that allows you to transform even the experiences that have caused us distress, have caused us the most suffering into qualities of strength. So what I'd love to do in finishing this uh, short presentation um, is to open up for questions or comments. I'd be really happy to um, hear more from you than from me. Always good to see you, Noah. <laughs> uh, so you talked of attentional imbalance. And most of us, all of us here, are engaged in making very useful pieces of technology that has really done a lot for the world, including democratizing information and enabling compassion. And yet, I often feel guilty that I'm the drug dealer making more weapons of mass distraction. Yes. Um, how do we reconcile the two? How do we find peace in that? Well, I'm so grateful you feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> So in your situation, a little uh, moral suffering could go a long way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you just don't want to sit there numb and not aware of the potential consequences of what you're doing in this corporation, both to benefit and to harm. And I think, you know, one of the facet, so I've sort of painted a kind of grim picture of the human species, but I think one of the really incredible things that's happening today is how many extraordinary people and projects are out there on the landscape, and I'm sure inside the 
Googleplex that are directed toward benefiting others. There's so much that is happening that is um, really upholding the best of our humanity. And it's also, as you say, um, I think uh, I, was, I was a little bit of an early adopter, so to speak, uh, in the early 90s, getting you know, uh, technology um, as a, a good ally in my life. And I also am sensitive to what you're talking about. The fact that our attentional ground has been completely fragmented um, by our technology, allowing for memes to actually enter our psyche and colonize us that are unwholesome. So part of it has to do with self-determination. <laughs> that is um, somehow creating the conditions where I as an individual, you as an individual, all of you individuals, um, value and instantiate within others the importance of um, actual, if you will, top-down control of these addictive tendencies in relation to our technology. And I think that's happening. Um, I, I think that, you know, I remember, uh, let's see, what is the name of that? Oh, Zynga. Yeah. I remember a conversation I had with one of the founders of Zynga who said, it was like, Farmville, are you kidding? Now it's like really out there. There's you know, all these alternate realities that people are plugged into that actually you have to buy sort of tokens for to create a kind of bigger power base and so forth. I feel like we should also um, uh, create, if you will, tokens of goodness, um, not just that kind of power. And I think we have a chance to work in a very creative way in, in shaping what is happening in our future in a positive direction. And I'll say from working in Nepal, which a few years ago, I don't know if this is still the case, but was um, uh, determined to be the second poorest country in Asia after Afghanistan. And uh, we're very, I'm very sensitive to the effects of technology both in the positive sense and the negative sense, on uh, Nepali people, high Himalayan people. Um, technology allows for greater connectivity, more information, better health care. It also helps them document uh, the beauty of their cultures, which are quickly disappearing at the same rate that the glaciers are melting. It uh, allows them to access language in a way that they could never access up until that point. It gives them access to education in a way that was never possible. But um, also the downside is the sort of deeper strains of those Himalayan cultures are being negatively affected by technology. How do we um, repraise, if you will, the value of cultural diversity and the importance of cultural identity in a world where tribalization is often uh, negative? And I think that technology can play an important part in that regard. And I'm counting on you guys <laughs> to do it. So good for you for your uh, moral suffering, Gopi. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I've read a little bit recently about um, compassion fatigue, uh, so, which is something professional caregivers spend sm so much of their energy um, helping others that they, they find that they don't have any left um, for, for friends and family. And in my last relationship, I was very much on the receiving end of that, which was very hard. I, a nurse who worked uh, in, in Nepal after the earthquake. A nurse who worked in Nepal after the earthquake. Absolutely. Daniel, the question Daniel asked is very interesting. It was about the f challenges associated with so-called compassion fatigue. So um, I think Richie Davidson, Mathieu Ricard, and I agree on many things, including the fact there's no such thing as compassion fatigue. Yeah. What actually um, one is experiencing is empathic distress. And it's created a problem inside healthcare systems where the, word compa or the term compassion fatigue has been used. And so that it's uh, conduced to a situation of suspicion toward the experience of compassion. So when we're in this kind of resonance with others, 
and over-identified, um, we can be easily overwhelmed. But compassion, as I described it, as uh, composing or comprised of attentional balance, emotional balance, insight and embodiment, it does not fatigue you. And what the fascinating research done by Davidson and Lutz and Chuck Rezon and Tanya Singer and a number of other neuroscientists and social psychologists have given us a good view that compassion actually enhances resilience, enhances immune response, enhances longevity. It's morally elevating. And when we don't respond compassionately, um, we feel morally compromised, as well as it's contagious. So when you see someone you know, out in the world doing a good thing, like, for example, Nicholas Winton or Wesley Autry, you have this feeling of, I want to be like that. It's this natural arising of this experience of the value of being in service to others. So I would love for you to just delete that term uh, from your um, psyche and to actually use another term, which is called empathic distress in its place. I have experienced empathic distress in the introduction, <clears throat> but compassion fatigue, it's not compassion that we're talking about. It really has to do with empathy and burnout. And so, you know, in the introduction to the empathy chapter, I talk about being in this small clinic in Nepal and a very uh, haggard man <clears throat> walked into the clinic clutching a little bundle in his arms. And um, one of our clinicians walked up, helped the man unwrap the bundle, and it was a little girl who was horribly burned. And so uh, we took her into one of the clinic's room, rooms and uh, she began the clinicians, the Nepali nurses and uh, doctors, and our team began to debride her wounds, but we didn't have pediatric anesthesia. And I was in such resonance with this child that um, I had a vasovagal response. I almost passed out. I thought I was going to throw up on the floor. And I just, you know, all of the life ran out of me. And then I realized I had this kind of insight. Wait a minute. That is not going to serve here. And I reallocated my attention to the sensation of my feet on the floor. I got myself grounded. And uh, as I was grounding myself, this um, sense of gratitude to the father for bringing this little girl into the clinic arose. I could feel my vascular system warm up, become happier, if you will. And then I had this sort of next kind of wave of just incredible gratitude for the clinicians who were serving this child. And um, that's compassion. Being in uh, affective resonance and somatic resonance with the child was empathy. I would have been wiped uh, for all of the work that I've done in the medical field as a support person. There's no way I could have sustained it. But in fact, um, compassion is characterized by uh, unbiased resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.